Hello people of YouTube, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of On Writing by Stephen King. Yes, somehow I've got this far in my life without reading this book. So I'm going to read you the blurb, and then I'm going to share a few thoughts, and look at my little tabs, and see what I tabbed to remind myself about. In June of 1999, Stephen King was hit by a van while walking along the shoulder of a country road in Maine. Six operations were required to save his life and mend his broken body. When he f was finally able to sit up, he immediately started writing. This book is the extraordinary result. Now actually, that blurb is a bit misleading, because he'd already started writing this book, before his accident and then he'd kind of put it on hold and then after his accident he decided to to finish it off but what is interesting is that the accident does play a huge part you know in the story really I mean what this is is it's a mixture between a, well it calls itself a memoir of the craft and that's very much what it is it's a mixture of memoir in terms of what happened with the accident but also King's own personal situations as he wrote many of his books and then also, it's just kind of almost like a style guide or something like that. It con contains all of his different advice on things like, you know, building characters and setting the scene and how you should edit. It even includes some stuff that's kind of less relevant now about finding an agent and a publisher and that kind of stuff. And obviously I say it's less relevant because nowadays anyone can self-publish and there are indie presses and all this kind of stuff. So there's arguably a different route now to publication than the one that King was familiar with. For example, he talks a lot about submitting stories to literary magazines and getting paid for them, which, I don't know, you very rarely see that now. Most, most times it's the other way around these days. You have to pay... Uh, a reading fee to some random magazine and then if you know if your story does get published you just get a contributor copy or something like that so it's very different to what it was like when King was kind of growing as a writer but it's interesting to see his take on it throughout this it's a weird thing because I kind of put off reading this for a long time because I got to the point where I knew I should have read it and I and I was worried that I'd read it and then, you know, uncover some secret to writing that I was previously unaware of and it would make all of my writing to date completely irrelevant. Fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, that didn't happen, but I did pick up a lot of little tips and pointers and all that kind of stuff from a, from a technical point of view to improve my writing. And also King just said a lot of things in this book that... I happen to agree with and I've kind of come to my own conclusions about that independently. In terms of the actual format of this book it's very odd because it's lots of different kind of sections. What would be good would be if we had a, a, a contents page but I don't think we do. We have a first forward, second forward, third forward, this then goes on to the section called CV. What's this section? Toolbox. It's actually quite just quite aesthetically pleasing inside as well. A lot of this is going to be literally me just reading aloud sections of this book because I just tabbed a bunch of them that really stood out to me and that really chimed with, with my own kind of approach to writing. So he says, Let's get one thing clear right now, shall we? There is no idea dump, no story central, no island of the buried bestsellers. Good story ideas seem to come quite literally from nowhere, sailing at you right out of the empty sky. Two previously unrelated ideas come together and make something new under the sun. Your job isn't to find these ideas, but to recognise them when they show up. And what I quite like is the fact, he kind of almost calls it like, it's a bit like excavating a fossil. And um, King is more of a, a pantser than a plotter, so he doesn't necessarily plot out the stories from end to end. And he says quite often they're based upon a single premise or a scene. So the girl who loved Tom Warden, Tom Gordon, sorry, is literally a book about a girl who gets lost in the woods. That's the idea behind the story. And he just started writing it and sort of, followed it to where it went, which I think is very interesting. Because of that, he kind of refers to getting these ideas as kind of excavating them, you dig away at them a little bit at a time, and he reckons that if you plot something out, it's like trying to excavate a dinosaur skeleton with like a, you know, a, a what do you call them, like a jackhammer. And uh, you don't want to do that. You want to you want to dust it off every piece and catalog it. Talks about where he had a spike on his wall where he used to put all of his rejection slips. So he said, by the time I was 14 and shaving twice a week, whether I needed to or not, the nail in my wall would no longer support the weight of the rejection slips impaled upon it. I replaced the nail with a spike and went on writing. By the time I was 16, I'd begun to get rejection slips with handwritten notes a little more encouraging than the advice to stop using staples and start using paper clips. The first of these hopeful notes was from Algis Budris, then the editor of fantasy and science fiction, who read a story of mine called The Night of the Tiger and wrote, this is good, not for us, but good, you have talent, submit again. Some of these are just almost little one-liners as well, so he said, 
When you write a story, you're telling yourself the story. When you rewrite, your main job is taking out all the things that are not in the story. What's cool is he talks about when um, Joe was born as well. So Joe King, who perhaps understandably is now known as Joe Hill. And um, Stephen King was at a, uh, a movie screening, one of those outdoor movie screenings. And it was three horror films back to back. And he was watching uh, The Corpse Grinders when somebody comes on, on the tannoy and says, uh, what's, it, what's it that he said? Steve King, please go home. Your wife is in labor. Steve King, please go home. Your wife is going to have the baby. I think this is really sweet as well. He, so he talks about his wife. His wife is Tabitha King, who's an accomplished novelist in her own right. He says, my wife made a crucial difference during those two years I spent teaching at Hamden and washing sheets at New Franklin Laundry during the summer vacation. If she had suggested that the time I spent writing stories on the front porch of our rented house on Pond Street or in the laundry room of our rented trailer on Platt Road in Herman was wasted time, I think a lot of the heart would have gone out of me. Tabby never voiced a single doubt, however. Her support was a constant, one of the few good things I could take as a given. And whenever I see a first novel dedicated to a wife or a husband, I smile and think, there's someone who knows. Writing is a lonely job. Having someone who believes in you makes a lot of difference. They don't have to make speeches. Just believing is usually enough. Tabitha King actually rescued Carrie, the manuscript, from a bin as well. And she took them out of the bin and read it, and she said she wanted to know the rest of the story. And he, Stephen King says, I told her I didn't know jack shit about high school girls. She said she'd help me with that part. She had her chin tilted down and was smiling in that severely cute way of hers. You've got something here, she said. I really think you do. Although he does admit he still never liked Carrie. He says twice that he never liked Carrie. And the second time he says it, he compares her to Eric Harris and Dylan Claybold, who are the Columbine shooters. Strong words, Stephen. He touches on a point that I've been thinking about recently in terms of... And I've been thinking about maybe doing a, a discussion video about this, so let me know if you want me to. But basically, about how I feel as though when you read a book, there's no such thing as like a subjective review. Even when you try to be objective, you're still, you just by your own very nature, you have to allow some of your subjectivity in. And I feel as though kind of every book, yeah, you've got the book in itself as a work, but then it's always interpreted very slightly differently by the people who pick it up. And... Um, King kind of touched on that without meaning to, I think. He was actually talking about something else. So he says, Look, here's a table covered with a red cloth. On it is a cage the size of a small fish aquarium. In the cage is a white rabbit with a pink nose and pink rimmed eyes. In its front paws is a carrot stub upon which is, it is contentedly munching. On its back, clearly marked in blue ink, is the numeral 8. Do we see the same thing? We'd have to get together and compare notes to make absolutely sure, but I think we do. There will be necessary variations, of course. Some receivers will see a cloth which is turkey red. Some will see one that's scarlet, while others may see still other shades. To colourblind receivers, the red tablecloth is the dark grey of cigar ashes. Some may see scalloped edges, some may see straight ones. Decorative souls may add a little lace, and welcome. My tablecloth is your tablecloth, knock yourself out. And I just thought that was interesting, and it kind of does refer the way that different people visualise different things differently. My vision of Hogwarts in my head is probably very different to yours. Another great quote here, um, he says, Let me say it again, you must not come lightly to the blank page. I'm not asking you to come reverently or unquestioningly. I'm not asking you to be politically correct or cast aside your sense of humour. Please God you have one. This isn't a popularity contest, it's not the moral Olympics and it's not church. But it's writing, damn it, not washing the car or putting on eyeliner. If you can take it seriously, we can do business. If you can't or won't, it's time for you to close the book and do something else. Wash the car, maybe. And from this point, he then starts talking about the writer's toolbox, and that's kind of where he gets to the nitty gritty of the different things you need to know. Talking about vocabulary, for example, he says, um, it ain't how much you've got, honey, it's how you use it. Here's an example of a writer with a wide vocabulary. So this is H.P. Lovecraft. The leathery, undeteriorative, and almost indestructible quality was an inherent attribute of the thing's form of organisation and pertained to some Paleogian cycle of invertebrate evolution utterly beyond our powers of speculation. And then he contrasts that to Hemingway, who said, He came to the river. The river was there. So he kind of says your vocabulary is something that goes in your toolbox along with your understanding of spelling and grammar and that kind of thing. And it's something that you just slowly develop over time. Some great advice here though, he says, make yourself a solemn promise right now that you'll never use emolument when you mean tip and you'll never say John stop long enough to perform an act of excretion when you mean John stop long enough to take a shit. He also says, American grammar doesn't have the sturdiness of British grammar. A British advertising man with a proper education can make magazine copy for ribbed condoms sound like the Magna Goddamn Carter, but it has its own scruffy charm. 
I used to work in advertising, and I'm British. He says, Take any noun, put it with any verb, and you have a sentence. It never fails. Rocks explode. Jane transmit. Mountains float. These are all perfect sentences. Many such thoughts make little rational sense, but even the stranger ones, plums deify, have a kind of poetic weight that's nice. The simplicity of noun-verb construction is useful. At the very least, it can provide a safety net for your writing. He also talks a lot about the elements of style. He kind of calls it the only book about writing that's worth having, and I've actually read that as well, so that's cool. And he says here, Will Strunk felt the reader was in serious trouble most of the time, E.B. White writes in his introduction to the elements of style. A man floundering in a swamp, and that it was the duty of anyone trying to write English to drain this swamp quickly and get this man up on dry ground, or at least throw him a rope. He says, writing is refined thinking. If your master's thesis is no more organised than a high school essay titled Why Shania Twain Turns Me On, you're in big trouble. He also says, if you want to be a writer, you must do two things above all others. Read a lot and write a lot. There's no way around these two things that I'm aware of, no shortcut. I'm a slow reader, but I usually get through 70 or 80 books a year, mostly fiction. I don't read in order to study the craft. I read because I like to read. He says, reading is the creative center of a writer's life. I take a book with me everywhere I go and find there are all sorts of opportunities to dip in. The trick is to teach yourself to read in small sips as well as in long swallows. Waiting rooms were made for books, of course, but so are theater lobbies before the show, long and boring checkout lines, and everyone's favorite, the John. You can even read while you're driving, thanks to the audiobook revolution. Of the books I read each year, anywhere from six to a dozen are on tape. As for all the wonderful radio you will be missing, come on. How many times can you listen to Deep Purple sing Highway Star? So King's an audiobook fan as well, good lad. You do get to see a lot of behind the scenes stuff as well, so he says, basically when he started writing Misery, it was, it was a 30,000 word novella in, in, in his mind, and he actually wrote it at a desk that used to belong to Rudyard Kipling in a hotel. It's very random. I can't read this note. I think it says fascinating to be Mac. Oh, I see, yeah. He hates it when people, especially writers, say like something was indescribable or they can't describe it. He says, if you want to be a successful writer, you must be able to describe it and in a way that will cause your reader to prickle with recognition. If you can do this, you will be paid for your labors and deservedly so. If you can't, you're going to collect a lot of rejection slips and perhaps explore a career in the fascinating world of telemarketing. I like this as well. He says, uh, he's talking about similes and he says, My all-time favourite similes, by the way, come from the hard-boiled detective fiction of the 40s and 50s and the literary descendants of the Dime Dreadful writers. These favourites include, It was darker than a carload of assholes, George V. Higgins, and I lit a cigarette that tasted like a plumber's handkerchief, Raymond Chandler. Those are some great similes, those. He talks about profanity and vulgarity and all that kind of stuff as well. And he says, uh, Consider this passage from Brainstorm by Richard Dooling, where vulgarity becomes poetry. Exhibit A. One loutish, headstrong penis. A barbarous cuntival without a fly speck of decency in him. The capscallion of all rapscallions. A scurvy, vermiform scug with a serpentine twinkle in his solitary eye. An orgulous Turk who strikes in the dark vaults of flesh like a penile thunderbolt. A greedy cur seeking shadows, slick crevices, tuna fish, ecstasy and sleep. And then he says, uh, I want to reproduce another passage from Dueling here because it speaks to the converse, that one can be quite admirably graphic without resorting to vulgarity or profanity at all. She straddled him and prepared to make the necessary port connections, male and female adapters ready, IO enabled, server client, master slave, just a couple of high end biological machines preparing to hot dock with cable modems and access each other's front end processors. Which actually, I find kind of funny because I've written a poem called Love Poem for a New Computer. You, my dear, are a thing of beauty. I mean, get a load of those contours. You are amazing. 16 gigabytes of RAM, ultra fast processor, dual screen capability, and holy moly, I'd like to dip your screens in maple syrup. I haven't even met you. The stories will tell. My God, the work will do. I know you don't have feelings, but I've got enough feelings for both of us. I shall name you Jane so you can be Jane Cobain, my little mainframe. Dear God, you've got more ports than Portsmouth. Open wide and get your trays out. I've got a big old disc to put into you. Now let the race to obsolescence begin. I wonder who will get there first. Thank you very much. I memorized my poem so I just it I just seemed like it might be a good time to read it I guess. He says 
When you write a book, you spend day after day scanning and identifying the trees. When you're done, you have to step back and look at the forest. Not every book has to be loaded with symbolism, irony or musical language. They call it prose for a reason, you know. But it seems to me that every book, at least every one worth reading, is about something. Your job during or just after the first draft is to decide what something or somethings yours is about. Your job in the second draft, one of them anyway, is to make that something even more clear. This may ne necessitate some big changes and revisions. The benefits to you and your reader will be clearer focus and a more unified story. It hardly ever fails. He also talks about um, writing courses. Writing courses and seminars do offer at least one undeniable benefit. In them, the desire to write fiction or poetry is taken seriously. For aspiring writers who have been looked upon with pitying condescension by their friends and relatives, you better not quit your day job just yet, is a popular line, usually delivered with a hideous Bob's your uncle grin. This is a wonderful thing. In writing classes, if nowhere else, it is entirely permissible to spend large chunks of your time off in your own little dream world. Still, do you really need permission and a hall pass to go there? Do you need someone to make you a paper badge with the word writer on it before you can believe you are one? God, I hope not. Which I could relate to that as well, because I did study creative writing and yeah. A lot of what he said about creative writing courses in this are totally correct. He says, The solution for a good many underpaid creative writers is to teach what they know to others. This can be a nice thing, and it's nice when beginning writers have a chance to meet with and listen to veteran writers they may have long admired. It's also great when writing classes lead to business contacts. I got my first agent, Morris Crane, courtesy of my sophomore comp teacher, the noted regional short story writer Edwin M. Holmes. <laughs> he says, After reading a couple of my stories in EH77, a comp class emphasising fiction, Professor Holmes asked Crane if he would look at a selection of my work. Crane agreed, but we never had much of an association. He was in his 80s, unwell, and died shortly after our first correspondence. I can only hope it wasn't my initial batch of stories that killed him. What's interesting as well is he talks about his return to writing after this injury and he just says, There was no miraculous breakthrough that afternoon, unless it was the ordinary miracle that comes with any attempt to create something. All I know is that the words started coming a little faster after a while, then a little faster still. My hips still hurt, my back still hurt, my leg too, but those hurts began to seem a little farther away. I started to get on top of them. There was no sense of exhilaration, no buzz, not that day. But there was a sense of accomplishment that was almost as good. I'd gotten going, there was that much. The scariest moment is always just before you start. After that, things can only get better. Hey Google, play things can only get better. Writing is magic, as much the water of life as any other creative art. The water is free, so drink. Drink and be filled okay, up. Okay, things can only get better by Howard Jones. Here it is on Spotify. Oh god, it's going off in the bedroom as well. Isn't it by D. Ream, anyway? He also talks near the end. He actually gives an example of one of his own first drafts that he's then gone in and copy edited, which is very cool. And he talks about, he says, um, Ah, here's the lucky Hawaiian shirt. It shows up in the first draft, but not until about page 30. That's too late for an important prop, so I stuck it up front. There's an old rule of theatre that goes, if there's a gun on the mantle in Act 1, it must go off in Act 3. The reverse is also true. If the main character's lucky Hawaiian shirt plays a part at the end of the story, it must be introduced earlier. Otherwise it looks like a deus ex machina, which of course it is. And what's also very cool at the end is he also incre includes a list of books that he read and enjoyed recently. So I'm not going to read them all out, but I did go through and identify how many of them I'd read. So what have we got? 7, 8, 11... So I'd read 11 of these, and they are... Maybe I've only read 10 of them. Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Lord of the Flies by William Golding. A Gun for Sale by Graham Greene. Our Man in Havana by Graham Greene. Hannibal by Thomas Harris. Harper Lee to Kill a Mockingbird. And then J.K. Rowling. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Prisoner of Azkaban and Sorcerer's Stone. Although it's called Philosopher's Stone here. And interestingly, King was kind of, I guess, ahead of the, the game then, because... That was at the point where only those three books were out. I mean, this was published in 2001, I think, so. And then at the end of it as well, there's a short story called Jumper by Garrett Adams, and it says, The following short story was chosen by Stephen King as the winner of the competition run by Hodder and Stoughton in conjunction with the Observer newspaper. Stephen King found the raw, punky style of this story appealing and said that the surprise ending did, in fact, surprise him. And yeah, it was a pretty good story. Obviously, it wasn't good, as good as King's writing, but it was pretty good, so... 
yeah, overall, this was great. I mean, let's just give it a rating and stop being about the bush. It's a five out of five. Easy. Every Stephen King fan should read this because it talks a lot about, you know, behind the scenes and how he actually creates them and how some of his most famous books came about. But equally, every writer should read this as well. It's just packed full of advice. It doesn't take too long to read. I mean, it's not massive, unlike some of his other books. And yeah, I just can't believe I waited so long to get around to it. But at least on the positive side, it does mean I can film a review for it for you guys. So... Anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Let me know with a comment if you've read this and if not, whether you're going to pick it up. Biggie has just come in to say hello, haven't you, Biggie? And uh, yeah, please hit the like button if you've enjoyed this video and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you soon for more bookish videos. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Look, he's down here. Biggie. Oh, he's just fucked off. Fine. Didn't want him in that video anyway.